Welcome everyone to the Disability and Jesus Sunday service for today, the second Sunday of Lent and the last day of February. In some ways it hardly seems possible that we're already two months into this year and yet in other ways it feels like this year has been about seven years long doesn't it because of lockdown and that always makes me remember when people say that about the number of people in our community who live in lockdown all the time and let's not forget those particularly who are still shielding and still waiting for their vaccines still waiting for it to be safe for them to live their lives as they've been used to doing it's something that reminds us that we live often and certainly at the moment carrying a cross we live through suffering we live through sacrifice and we do something that's really an essential part of what it means to be a christian disciple we live for each other we think about each other we wear our masks to protect each other and we seek each other's well-being in everything we do and so as we move through this service today i'd encourage you to do what i'm doing which is to remember that we are a community that even though we're apart we are together not just in this service today but in our lives that we're bound together through this wonderful community and we support one another pray for one another and seek one another's well-being and so let's enjoy this service let's listen to god through this service and let's pray for one another in this service as we come together our confessional prayers of penitence today are adapted from the we worship book from the iona community at the end of each talk section of prayer when i say lord have mercy we say together lord have mercy or Christ have mercy. And we say together, Christ have mercy. So let's pray. In you, gracious God, those who are widowed find a companion, those who are orphaned find a parent, those who are fearful find a friend. On them and on us, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. In you, gracious God, those who are wounded find a healer, those who are penitent find a pardoner. Those who are burdened find a counsellor. On them and on us, Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. In you, gracious God, those who are mean find generosity. Those who are despondent find a laughter maker. Those who are rule bound find a rule breaker. On them and on us, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And if we need to say, help me, and if we need to say, save me, and if we need to say, forgive me, then let these be said now, where we are, as who we are. Gracious God, your heart is welcoming and warming. Whilst we are still far off, you run to meet us and bring us home. You offer us all that is needed to make us whole. We receive your forgiveness gratefully. And if we are not quite ready, we will wait with you as you wait with us. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, by the prayer and discipline of Lent, may we enter into the mystery of Christ's sufferings, and by following in his way, come to share in his glory. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. An extra reading for you this week from Genesis chapter 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. 
for I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. Here ends our reading. And now we go to Jules for today's Gospel. The reading is from Mark 8, 31 to 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Today's readings are concerned with the eyes of faith. We meet Abraham in the Old Testament reading. And when we meet Abraham, he's 99 years old. And like anybody who's 99 years old, he doesn't feel as if there's a great deal ahead of him. He's spent a life hoping and waiting to have an heir. And that's not happened except through his concubine Hagar. But his wife Sarai has never conceived and Abraham, in many ways, in the world's eyes, is a man who's all but finished. He's too old at 99 for very much. He's too lame. He's too past it. He doesn't really have very much in the way of a future. In fact, for Abraham, in the world's eyes and in the eyes of his culture, there's not really very much earthly hope. And yet, God has a different view. God's view is about the future. God comes to Abram and he says to him, walk with me. An odd thing to say to somebody who's 99, walk with me. Because that invitation to walk with me is about a journey into the future. It's a future-focused invitation. It affirms that Abraham still has a journey to make. It affirms that he still has a future to explore. And that future is full of God and God's promise. God's promise that he will become not just Abram, but Abraham, the father of many. This is beyond human possibility or human understanding. Abram, who's lived his life living up to his name, that God is exalted, that's what Abram means, is to become Abraham, father of many nations. He's to become something new and something different in the promise of God, even though he's old and probably lame and a bit past it, and in the world's eyes, not of much value or of much use. And along with Avram, who becomes Avraham, 
his wife Sarai, who means the one who struggles. It's the same root word as Israel, which means those who struggle with God. Sarai is to become Sarah, the, the queen, the princess. Again, the head of a family whose descendants will matter and will be important. So Abraham and Sarah between them are a couple whose great age and situation and circumstance and experience is not to deflect them from the future promise of God. They believed in that future promise of God and because of that belief they were counted as righteous and the promises of God were enabled to come true in and through them. And that's not to say that from that moment of accepting God's promise, life became easy. It's not to say that there were no more struggles, that everything was straightforward. That's absolutely not the case. And it's not the case for Christians today. There's no, I met Jesus and all my troubles were over about Christian faith. It remains something about pilgrimage and it remains something about struggle and often suffering, but with the assurance of God's promise and the assurance that God's promise will be fulfilled in us and through us. The eyes of faith that Abraham and Sarah had saw the promise and its fulfillment, even though their human eyes couldn't possibly see that. They overcame what a purely human understanding could show them and they trusted in God. And of course, as Christians, we look always to Jesus, one of those descendants whom Abraham and Sarah were promised, the fruit of the promise in ultimate terms. Do people see that? Well, that's the question that Jesus himself was asking in today's gospel. Who do people say that I am? And his disciples gave him all sorts of examples of what people were saying. But Jesus came to them with the key question. And it's the question that every disciple, every Christian, every one of us has to answer. Jesus comes and says to Peter on behalf of the disciples, you, who do you say that I am? And we have to be ready to answer that question. Who do we say? that Jesus is. And Jesus asks that question because he wants to know two things. First of all, he wants to know if the disciples realise who he is, but also he wants to know if they understand what the implications of that are, what the consequences of that are. And to the first part of that, Peter answers with the correct answer. You are the Messiah the son of the living God. But as to the second part, what that implies and what the consequences are, he's not quite there. When it comes to Jesus telling them about the fact that the son of man must undergo suffering and be crucified and rise again, Peter can't quite cope with that. This must never happen to you, Lord. He's still seeing Jesus and even understanding the Messiah in human terms. He needs to be able to see with the eyes of faith. He needs to be able to see what God sees, what God sees in Jesus and what God shows through Jesus. He needs to understand that that life of self-offering, self-giving, of love that goes to limit without limit, that that is what Messiah is about, that that is what the promise of God is about. They un need to understand the disciples through eyes of faith. And we too need eyes of faith to see what Jesus means for us. Because we too are invited with Abraham, with the disciples, to walk with God. And we need to understand, firstly, that that's no easy path, that a walk with God will involve struggle. It will involve suffering. It will involve sacrifice because we are called 
to lose our lives for God and for others in order to find our lives in that very self-offering and self-giving. We're called to have a future focus, a future focus on the promises of God. We're called to see our discipleship, our life with eyes of faith. And that means bearing one another. It means bearing the cross. It means bearing the promise. And when we bear the promise, when we bear one another and bear the yoke of Christ, the cross of Christ, then we find that we're able to do all that we do with that future focus from those eyes of faith. We're able to invest, not in ourselves, but in what we can do for others here and now and in the future. We're able to invest generously of our time and our resources and our talents and our gifts to invest them in the mission of the kingdom of God, in building the church of God, to invest not simply for the return we get, as if we're paying for a service or buying a ticket to an experience. No, we're called to liberally scatter the seed that we have in our time and our talents and our resources and our gifts and our skills, to scatter that seed so that it might grow and bear fruit Fruit that we might never see, but others will. We're called to plant trees in whose shade we'll never sit, but others will. To be liberally and joyfully and gleefully generous with all that God's given to us. To build for that future, even if we ourselves won't personally reap the benefit. That's what being Christians, disciples is all about. That's what participating in that great stream of blessing that started with Abraham and Sarah is all about. Knowing that those who come after us will enjoy and reap the benefit of the legacy that we leave them. And so we're called to understand that, to see it through the eyes of faith, to see the promise and our part in fulfilling it, to see what we can do with our hands of faith, to bless others both now and in the future, to see what we can know with our minds of faith, that see not just what's in it for us or what's in it for the here and now, but what's in it for others and for the future. We're called ultimately to understand the promises of God with hearts of faith, that don't simply look to satisfy instant desires or the desires of today or the desires of our own well-being, but seek to lose our lives in the joy of God, that we might find that life in all its abundance that God wishes for us. And to see through those eyes and ears and hands and hearts and minds of faith, that even where the world says, like it might have said to Abram, you have nothing to offer. We are, in fact, like the little child who had his five loaves and his two fish and offered them to Jesus, and which Jesus took and fed 5,000 men besides the women and children that were there. Many thousands of people through the willingness and the generosity of that one boy to offer what he had that looked so meagre and so poor and let God use it. Will we have that future focus on the promises of God that Abram had and Sarai had that led them to becoming Abraham and Sarah? Will we have that future focus on the promises and love of God that enabled Peter and the other disciples to follow Jesus? Yes, in suffering and sacrifice towards the cross that led them through the cross and to the empty tomb? Will we have those eyes and hands and ears and minds and hearts of faith that will allow us to do as Jesus asks, to build his church, to grow his kingdom, and to leave a generous legacy of faith 
for those who come after us, that they in their turn may do the same. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our prayers of intercession are also adapted from the We Worship book from the Iona community. At the end of each short section of prayer, when I say, your kingdom come, we say together, your will be done. So let's pray for the breaking in of God's kingdom in our world today. Jesus, you taught us to trust you in all things. We hold to your word and share your plea. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where nations budget for war, whilst you say, put up your sword, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where powerful governments claim their policies are heaven blessed, while scripture states that you bless the powerless, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where those who speak up for dignity are treated with scorn or contempt, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where our prayers falter, our faith weakens, our hope fades, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, where we are broken in body, mind and spirit, and wholeness seems far from us, your kingdom come, your will be done. Jesus, you have declared that your kingdom is among us. Open our lives to receive you. Strengthen our hands to serve you. Give courage to our hearts to love you and our neighbour and ourselves. Amen. The Lord's Prayer Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. As we reach the end of our time together this week, we continue to pray for each other and we send one another out into the week ahead with some words of blessing. May Christ give us grace to grow in holiness, to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us today and always. Amen. So let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.